discrimination. And he didn't see in that in the South. And it was real interesting of, about the man. He was, it was like he felt that this man should be aware that he was there. He was looking for that hostility, you know, or, or, or just that he was just probably uncomfortable with the idea that here I am, now I can sit beside this man. And this man then even, you know, it's to the point where these folks in the world, <coughs> when it comes to, you know, a black man being on a train or in the, in, uh, in the area sitting where they're, where he's sitting, that they're not even aware of it, yeah. that racism was completely different. So what do you make of this where he says that he, he, he talks about this new kind of tension. He said, I began to grow tense again, although it was a different sort of tension than I had known before. Before in the South, blacks were, you know, noticed because in, in a negative way. It's like a kid acting up in the classroom. It's a negative. It just want negative attention. Here, he's invisible. It's not like he even exists. And so now, instead of being noticed because he's black, he's not noticed at all. And so that's a whole different thing. It's like the, the child that sits there quiet, is never even noticed. That you, you know, you don't even remember their name the next year because they never spoke of the whole year. So it's. Yeah. But now I think the tension was coming more from uh, him not knowing, okay, here, here I am in this new place that I've heard all these things about, and now how am I supposed to act? You know, what is expected of me here? In the South, even though it was a degrading kind of thing, he, he knew what to expect. Yeah. Here he didn't know what to expect at all. And anytime you're in a, in a situation like that, it's going to bring on a new kind of tension. You know, you know, Hannah, because my students and I, we were doing the, uh, the uh, Great Migration. And one of the things that uh, was brought out was that, and it was from some uh, primary sources, that was brought out that the, uh, that the blacks that came from the South, it was almost like they had to be sort of schooled by the ones from the North, because they didn't really know how to dress. And they came in all these loud colors. And it was sort of like, oh, I'm here, I've arrived, here I am, this is the reason I have on this color, these colors. And uh, it was really funny, because one of the students were reading where the, uh, the person from the South was eating a piece of chicken, he just threw the bones in the, you know, in the, in the street. And they were like, oh no, you know, we don't do this in the North. So it was like a new kind of culture. That's a, oh, sorry. Okay, I'm sorry, go no, 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 no. A new kind of culture from the, uh, <coughs> like he had to learn a new way. This is a great segue, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it's just, you're, you're perfectly setting up exactly what I'm going to say, okay. so I don't okay. want to interrupt you. Sorry. But no, 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 keep going, keep yeah. going. But it was, uh, and then the students were like, well, and, and when we did the Great Migration, well, we, well, we had a, a culture festival, and my students presented the, the Great Migration, and they sang uh, a couple of the Great Migration songs and now uh, one was about a train was get on this. I, I can't remember, I should have brought it with me. But anyway, it was, they were just, the, the words of the song, like your song, was telling about, you know, uh, the, why they were leaving the South and you know, what they had to experience. Right. And, you know, they dressed, they put on the, they found the loud colors and, you know, they portrayed the, you know, what, what the black from the side, what that, what those things probably sources were saying. And it was like, okay, now I'm in the north, okay, uh, because the blacks that were there, some of them had been there for quite some time, and they had sort of, their culture had sort of changed, and now I've got to learn this new culture. Right. Even a new black culture. Right, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly, right. So in 1920, the Chicago Commission on Race Relations told black migrants about what they liked about the North, and a resounding number, nearly all the migrants, answered freedom. Of course, freedom meant different things to different people, just as it had 50 years earlier at the time of emancipation. But we can't underestimate the possibility of no longer having to tip one's hat to a white man or scrambling to yield the sidewalk to a white woman, of no longer being derisively and disrespectfully called boy or girl by whites who were 
far younger in age. My grandmother, who migrated from New Orleans, Louisiana to Chicago in 1945, remembered not being able to bring her children, including my mother, to the public parks in New Orleans without asking for trouble. She remembered not being able to try on hats in stores without being compelled to buy them. But perhaps my grandmother's most vivid memory was seeing a black man physically kicked off of a moving train. Just last Sunday, when I was talking to my grandmother about um, this lecture, and my grandmother will turn 100 in June, um, and when I asked her why she and my grandfather decided to move to Chicago, it was that memory from almost 70 years earlier that was the first story that she recalled. Witnessing that appalling violence, the thoughtless and vicious way that the man was kicked off the train would stay with my grandparents and would set their plans to leave the South in motion. So we can't underestimate what it meant to have the right to vote, uh, what it meant to be free from perpetual debt, to have no recourse or options from redress from a landlord's abuses. The North offered entirely new racial protocols and promised to be a place where, as one Pullman porter explained, a man is a man. So now the question is, did the North live up to its billing as a promised land? First of all, rapid population growth in a number of cities resulted in overcrowding of black residents in certain enclaves and taxed urban resources and worried reformers, black and white alike. This strain was especially obvious when it came to housing stock. So these, this, this is an image of kitchenettes, and these were buildings that landlords converted um, old houses into kitchenettes, so they might take a seven-room apartment that would rent for $50 a month and cut it up into seven small apartments of one room each, install a small gas stove and a small sink in each room, and rent each of these for $42 a month. So entire families occupied single rooms, sharing with other residents an inadequate number of bathrooms and kitchens, exceeding the plumbing capacity, and leading to serious deterioration in sanitary conditions. And this housing shortage and mounting racial tensions led to a race riot in Chicago in 1919, when a black teenager's raft floated too close to a white beach on the south side. The, the, the black teenager died after being struck by a rock. Between July 27th and 31st, black and white Chicagoans battled in the streets. By August 8th, 23 blacks and 15 whites were dead, and at least 537 Chicagoans had suffered injuries. The police were unable and unwilling to suppress the violence, and only a timely rainstorm and the belated assignment of the Illinois National Guard to Chicago city streets restored order. <coughs> Although many newcomers were disappointed by the failure of Chicago race relations to live up to their expectations, the 1919 riot highlighted some of the liberating aspects of the Great Migration, even as it demonstrated the ubiquity of racial conflict. Chicago's riot grew out of a competitive situation that suggested the importance of blacks in the city's political and economic life, as well as in its housing market. The riot also revealed a growing black militancy that would have provoked either repression or expulsion in the South. When whites attacked, blacks fought back, and the Chicago Defender kept score right on the front page. The need for social welfare and urban development programs led to the creation of the National Urban League, founded in New York in 1911, I'm sorry, 1916. One of the most important of the new social service agencies formed especially to address urban conditions for blacks. 
By 1919, the National Urban League had 30 branches in 30, I'm sorry, had branches in 30 cities, including this one in Chicago, which was founded in 1916. So, so actually the Chicago, the, the National Urban League was founded in 1911. The Chicago branch was founded in 1916. And this branch emerged as the leading social service agency in the black community by providing housing, employment, social work, and relief to migrants. The Urban League also legislated morality through door-to-door -door visits and leaflets like this one, which I've passed out to everyone. And maybe we can just take a minute to look at these helpful hints. Um, and I'll just read two of them because I know it's hard to read, but you, you have this as a, as a handout. So one of these is don't carry on loud conversations or use vulgar or obscene language on streetcars, <coughs> streets, or in public places. Remember that this hurts us as a race. Don't go about the streets or on the streetcar in bungalow aprons, boudoir caps, and house slippers. Wear regular street clothes when you go into the streets. And then these are two that I struggle with. Um, don't, don't tell Jim. Uh, don't think you can hold your job unless you are on time, industrious, efficient, and sober. <laughs> and don't stay away from work every time someone gives a picnic or boat ride. Stay on your job. Others do. So what do you make of these helpful hints? How helpful are they, in fact? And what kinds of concerns is the National Urban League voicing about the presence of, of new migrants. They don't want to, the negative behavior that they're outlining, they don't want to detract from what they've already achieved in the North, any opportunity they've already gotten. They don't want that to be retracted by this negative behavior. Exactly, 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 right. So the migrants who had already been in Chicago for, for longer, who were known as the old settlers, were very concerned. They had this very tenuous relationship with whites in Chicago, and they're really terrified of, well, what's going to happen when we have this influx of new migrants who are going to bring these sort of country ways with them? How is that going to make us look? Now, what do you make of these two images, these pictures? Why do you think the National Urban League, number one, decided to use a woman? Um, and what do you make of this image here and then this image here? What do you think about these two images? Well, because the image, the first image, this one over here, would write all the <coughs> bring to mind a person that I guess you could say maybe uh, that she doesn't look really well groomed mm -hmm. and she looked it sort of looked hard in hard times mm -hmm. and you know the, this is sort of a reminder of what they had come from mm -hmm. and they were trying to 